My name is Morgan Bryan. I'm a member of the business and property team in Chambers. Uh, welcome to the property webinars. Today, I'm joined by Matthew Crow and Nicola Allen. And this particular webinar is on the subject of Talata. Given it's the silver anniversary of the Talata legislation, it seems a, an appropriate time to produce a talk summarizing the subject uh, and spending a, a little time examining the current position with regards to property disputes under Talata and considering some recent case law. Uh, I propose to touch on the law and the procedure in relation to these disputes, uh, very quickly examine occupational rent claims in line with Talata disputes as these can sometimes be overlooked. Talata is one of those areas in law uh, that overlaps with an, a number of areas, in particular property, family and occasionally insolvency law. I hope that this webinar will be useful to practitioners in all of those fields. It's slightly unusual in this series in that it's one of the few webinars, as far as I can tell, that hasn't really been significantly impacted by any legislation arising out of the pandemic. Uh, that being said, uh, there is some impact in these types of disputes owing to the pandemic, particularly in the time taken for them to get to court and also in the time taken when judges are considering how long and whether to make an order for sale, uh, given the ongoing issues with regards to property and housing law generally. The reality is that this is an area where there hasn't been a significant amount of development in the law itself in the past 25 years. The real impact that there has been has been in the case law and uh, particularly with the decision of Stack and Dowden, uh, the case law since then has been to various degrees uh, an interpretation of the Act and an interpretation of Lady Hill's judgment in that famous decision. And before we look and examine the case law in depth, uh, I think it's a useful starting point to consider the legislation again uh, and examine the most uh, important sections of that. Uh, what does the Act itself uh, actually say and what powers do it provide? Uh, under Section 1, under the Trust of Land and Appointment of Trustees Act 1996, it helpfully defines what a trust of land is, that is namely any trust of property which consists or includes land, um, fairly obvious given the title of the legislation, but nonetheless a helpful definition. The sections that practitioners will most often consider are those contained within sections 12 through to 15. Section 12 provides a right um, for those with a beneficial interest in property to occupy said property. Section 13 of the Act provides a right of any trustee to exclude uh, or restrict a beneficiary's entitlement to occupy the said property. So those two sections to a degree go hand to hand and Section 13 also allows for the imposition of conditions on any occupation. The powers of the court uh, are set out in section 14 uh, and those are worth scrutinising in depth because not only do they set out the powers of the court, they also set out what the limitations of those powers are and in particular the court has the power to grant declaratory relief and that it allows the court to find what the party shares and declares what those are accordingly. It allows the it allows the court to grant an order for sale and it allows the court to make an order for an account of the profits in any trust property. What is not included in the powers of the court in section 14 is that the court cannot order a sale, a transfer or a purchase of said shares that it finds. It effectively does not allow the court or permit the court to order one party to transfer or create shares to another. And in examining and addressing the powers of the court, the court is required to consider the factors that are set out in section 15. And those are the factors that are relevant to almost any Talata dispute. And in particular, they contain uh, the intention of the people who created the trust, the purpose for which the property is held, the welfare of any minor, and that factor is of particular importance when a court is considering whether to make 
an order for sale and finally the interest of any creditors and that factor will uh, no doubt be very familiar to those who practice in insolvency. That uh, is a fairly quick run through of the statute. It effectively gives the court the power to declare what each party's respective interest in a property is and thereafter potentially make uh, an order for that property to be sold depending on the various uh, interests, intentions of the parties and the purpose for which the property is sold. And in terms of examining how uh, the courts address those powers, it is worth uh, looking at the case law. Starting, of course, with uh, Stack and Dowden, which will be familiar to anyone who has any knowledge of Talata at, at all. It was and arguably still is the most important case uh, in this area. Uh, and it contains that famous judgment of, of Lady Hale. Uh, I don't intend to repeat the facts here, uh, save as to set out um, the important principle uh, contained within the decision of Lady Hale. And uh, to remind everyone that this uh, decision in particular, Stack and Dowden and the following case, which I'll address, Jones and Kono, um, concerned a joint name case in a domestic context. What was fundamental in uh, the decision in Stack uh, was the principle that, uh, as was held, equity follows the law. Uh, the presumption, therefore, was that a beneficial interest matches the legal interest. Effectively, therefore, that when parties purchase a property in joint names, the court held that that indicates a joint legal and beneficial interest unless the contrary is proved. Therefore, the question in a joint named case is where one of the parties naturally is arguing to the contrary. The question is whether the parties intended that their beneficial interest to be different from their legal interest, and if so, to what extent. Uh, the decision in Stack confirmed what the task of the court was, which was uh, to ascertain what the parties' shared intentions were, either their actual inferred or imputed intention in light of the whole course of their dealings. It was not just restricted to examination of the financial um, contributions to the party or to the property by the parties uh, and the crucial factors in examining the course of dealings and uh, ascertaining what those shared intentions were were helpfully surmised by Lady Hill in paragraph 69 of that judgment which provides a non-exhaustive list of factors for the court to consider uh, and that paragraph in particular is worth um, reading and rem reminding oneself of before I'm um, considering the facts in any uh, Talata case and um, providing advice on the, the potential outcomes but those factors included uh, the financial contributions of the parties, the advice given at the time that transfer was made, the reason for the purchase, uh, and the reason for putting the property into either a, a sole name or joint names, the nature of the party's relationship, uh, as well as the arrangement of the party's uh, finances. And that in itself is not an exhaustive list of the factors that were set out in that paragraph and as has already been said, um, the factors there were not an exhaustive list and the court is entitled to consider all the circumstances of the case. And the decision in Stack and the judgment of Lady Hale summed it up by saying that cases where parties beneficial interests uh, are, are different from the legal interest are, are very unusual. Um, Notwithstanding that, um, that is exactly what the House of Lords, as it was then, uh, went on to find uh, and that Stack was one of those unusual cases where the party's beneficial interests did differ um, from their legal interests owing to the respective circumstances of that case. Um, the decision in Stack was um, clarified, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, a little bit further by the Supreme Court in Jones and Curnow. Um, again, this was a, a joint named case in a domestic context, um, but the court did also uh, address in a little bit more detail um, the issue of sole name cases, and it reaffirmed the position that there is no presumption of a resulting trust in a domestic context, i.e. there's no presumption that the party's beneficial interests are in proportion to their financial contributions.
and in a sole name case, uh, although the decision itself was um, concerned with a, a joint named case, um, the court did um, find, albeit over her, um, that the starting point there in a sole name case was to establish whether there was an intention between the parties that the unnamed party on the property was to have a beneficial interest. Uh, that was the first question in a sole name case. Uh, and it went on to, to give some guidance as to assessing um, that question and stated that the intention of the parties is to be de deduced objectively from their conduct. Um, what does that actually mean uh, for a party's intention to be deduced from their conduct? Well, the court helpfully clarified that question by stating that it means that the relevant intention of each party is the intention which was reasonably understood by the other party to be manifested by that party's words and conduct, notwithstanding that he did not consciously formulate that intention in his own mind or even acted with some different intention which he did not communicate to the other party. Um, how were the party's shares to be assessed after a, a common intention was found. Once that common intention between the parties was established uh, and once it was established that each party was to have an interest, the task of the court then was to infer what that interest was based on the list of factors um, that were addressed in stack at paragraph 69, which we've uh, touched on briefly. And if that uh, level or if the quantity of the interest um, could not be inferred, but the intention was there. The court uh, is required to impute an intention having regard to the party's whole course uh, of dealings. In other words, if the court can make a finding as to what the parties actually intended uh, the respective interest to be, it must make that finding. If it can't, it will have to impute that finding having regard to what is fair. Uh, those are, are two of the most important cases concerning, well, both joint and sole name cases in a domestic context, and they continue to form the bedrock of any argument about who owns property in a domestic context, and um, particularly with regards to uh, non-married couples cohabiting. Um, that really summarises the domestic context. What is the, the position in a commercial context? Well, that was touched upon in the decision of Lasker and Lasker. And, and although uh, I say commercial context, uh, this was a commercial property um, that was purchased by a mother and daughter, albeit it was a property to be purchased for uh, an investment rather than uh, their uh, residential home. Uh, the property in Lasker um, was purchased using a, a joint mortgage and effectively um, equal, albeit modest, savings. Um, well, broadly speaking, equal um, and modest savings from each. But also, and importantly, um, it was purchased using a right-to-buy discount um, that had been secured um, by the mother. Uh, in the case, when the, uh, the matter got to trial, the judge found that the parties and despite being uh, mother and daughter, ha had lived independent lives and that the property was bought uh, and purchased as an investment as neither party lived in it. Um, but the important finding in, in relation to the law was that the presumption of um, joint ownership, um, the presumption that was stated in, in Stack and confirmed in Jones that equity follows the law, was held not to apply in a commercial context. Uh, interestingly, however, given the facts of Lasker, uh, it was held um, that even if the presumption had applied and um, the finding still would have been made that the party's interest in, in the property was different owing largely um, to the way that they had managed their finances and how the property w was bought. And the outcome in Lasker Different to the, the presumption of joint ownership, the outcome was that uh, the daughter was found to have 33% ownership, which effectively matched her contributions, taking into account the mother's right to buy discount. And the Court of Appeal decided that in that context, where a property is bought as an investment, even in light of the family relationship between the two, 
uh, the principles of a resulting trust would apply, i.e. that the shares of the interest would be in proportion to the financial contribution made by each party. Uh, broadly speaking, therefore, we have a, a situation where that both Stack and Jones were saying that in a domestic context, a constructive trust applies uh, and the task of the court is to ascertain what the party's common intention was, whereas in a commercial context such as Lasker, the court was saying um, the party's interest in the property is more likely to be found to be in proportion to their financial contributions. Um, there was further examination in a commercial context in a, a decision made by the Privy Council back in 2017 in the case of Marr and Colley. It's not particularly recent, um, but it is nevertheless slightly unusual to get a Talata case heard in the Privy Council. Uh, and the brief facts of, of Marr were that the parties were in a relationship, but they purchased a number of properties, uh, the vast majority, if not all, in joint names, and most of them were purchased as investment properties. Uh, and the appellant's position by the appellant at the Privy Council was effectively that as he had financed those purchased purchases, um, he should be awarded a interest um, in proportion with his financial contribution based on the, the principle in Lasker. Uh, what the, the Privy Council held is that the, in, in terms of the law, they ultimately confirmed that the, the ratio uh, and decision of stack was not purely confined to domestic situations and that in a commercial context, the party's intentions still remained crucial. Um, and it does not always follow in a commercial case that a resulting trust, which was the outcome in Lasker, uh, will be the case. And, and therefore, the ultimate position was that even in a commercial context, the party's intention, particularly at the time of purchase, remains key. It nevertheless remains the case that it's more likely than not, um, I would gauge, that a, a resulting trust will be the most appropriate solution, as that was the comment of the Privy Council in a commercial dispute but it does not necessarily follow, nor is there a presumption to that extent. And the ultimate decision was that the um, appeal was allowed uh, to the extent that the case had to be remitted on the basis that um, the judge at trial had failed to conduct a, a proper examination of the party's actual intention um, when um, the purchases of those properties had taken place. Um, Th those four cases, um, to a large extent, broadly summarise the position um, with regards to domestic and commercial um, disputes in the Talata context. Uh, I briefly touch upon two recent decisions to show how those judgments have been applied and then quickly examine um, the procedure uh, in these disputes. Um, uh, a recent case of uh, Amin and Amin from 2020 heard in the High Court. Um, the facts of this case, it was an appeal from a decision of a circuit judge and that decision was that the appellant um, in the High Court had no beneficial interest in a property that was purchased in her sole name. Um, the, the decision to appeal uh, was therefore on the face of it not particularly surprising, bearing in mind um, the decisions that we've looked at in, in Stack and Dowden and Jones and Colonel as to the presumption that equity follows the law. Um, but it, in Amman, the parties regarded themselves as, as husband and wife, although not legally or, or technically married. It was a rather complex uh, history given the number of transactions that took place, but the case itself concerned one property in particular that had been originally purchased back in 1995 by uh, the respondent. Um, it was then sold to the appellant's cousin um, and the, the judge found at trial that, that the seal of the property was really a device used to raise some equity for the parties. Um, but after the seal, it was bought back by the appellant and transferred into her sole name. Uh, the respondent uh, at the appeal was um, the deceased partner and um, two sons of the appellant. And the judge, um, as I said, initially found that the property was held on trust by the appellant and for all three defendants. And that finding was made 
largely on the, the basis and on the finding of fact that the uh, appellant had made no financial contribution um, to the purchase price. Uh, it was a notable case, um, well, that aspect of the case was notable in itself um, that the appeal court refused to overturn the finding of fact to that effect, despite there being some evidence uh, on the face of the documents that there was a, a slight financial contribution uh, and it shows the risks um, and the hurdles to overcome in uh, attempting to appeal a finding of fact. But in terms of the law, which we are focused on, um, the judge stated um, in, in appeal that in each case, whether it be a sole name or a joint name, um, what needs to be found in order to displace the presumption that equity follows the law is a common intention that the beneficial ownership should be something different from the legal ownership, effectively restating what Lady Hale held back in stack. Uh, and that um, question is to be deduced, deduced uh, again objectively from the party's conduct. Uh, no real change there, uh, and the judge in Ammon referred to the list of factors again set out in paragraph 69 of Stack and found um, or held that what may be relevant to the first question of the court in assessing what the common intention of the parties were uh, would also be relevant um, to the question of. Uh, the level of interest to each party uh, and, and vice versa and essentially found that the evidence relevant to the amount of a beneficial interest is also therefore likely to be relevant to whether there was in fact a common intention or not as to whether there should be a beneficial interest different or, or the same as the legal ownership and although um, the decision was one of those unusual cases where the beneficial interest was in this case entirely different from the legal interest in that the legal owner was found um, not to have any beneficial interest. Uh, the appeal judge stated uh, it was a surprising decision in itself um, but that was partly due to how each case was run on a effectively all or nothing basis. Uh, each party's contention was that 100% of the property belonged to them and there, there was no case uh, run in the alternative. Um, it's, as I say, a slightly more unusual case than even um, perhaps Lady Hale would have predicted. It, it doesn't really say anything new on the law. It is, um, it's after all a high court case, but the judgment does provide a useful summary of the law and uh, the judgment in itself arguably encapsulates the principles of any Talata and dispute surrounding um, beneficial ownership at paragraph 34 where the judge stated that the broad question is always what did the parties intend and if you take nothing else uh, away from this webinar uh, that is what is useful to have in mind uh, at any point you're advising a client when it comes to uh, a dispute uh, based on uh, the Talata uh, Act. Uh, and regardless of the context, domestic, commercial, joint name or, or sole name, and that is effectively what the court is tasked with examining. Um, the, there is nonetheless, or there may be a difference of presumption of joint ownerships in a domestic case um, for a property purchased in joint names, uh, where that may not be the case in a commercial investment context um, due to the decisions in Lasker and, and Marr and Collier, which still stand um, to degree uh, as good law. Uh, finally, um, the last case, which I touch upon, uh, one that was handed down in March of this year, Roland and Blades. And um, there's a fantastic article about this case on the Daily Mail, which you may find somewhat more interesting um, than either the judgment or this webinar, but that is to do neither of those a, a disservice. Um, the facts of the case uh, concerned a holiday home, which at the time of trial was valued at around two and a half million pounds. Um, the property was purchased um, and placed in joint names, but was paid for entirely by the claimant and paid for in cash. And to some extent, it is almost the, the polar opposite of a typical sole name case, uh, where in a sole name case, um, uh, in a Talata dispute anyway, parties contribute financially and to some extent, but then it's placed in one of their names. In this case, only one party made the financial contributions, 
when it was placed in both of their names. And the claimant's position was effectively saying, I've made all the, the financial contributions, therefore uh, I own all the equity. Um, and it was the defendant, um, despite that contribution, who spent most of the time in the property, uh, so much so that there was a claim for occupational rent by um, brought by uh, the claimant, uh, as well as his um, claim as to a declaration as to his respective interest. Um, and as I say, the argument made by the claimant in a nutshell was, I contribute it entirely, therefore I own it entirely. Um, and his position was, it was uh, to be owned by him and then passed his daughter, um, albeit with the defendant having the right to live in it. Uh, the defendant's position, unsurprisingly, was relying on the decision in stack that um, equity follows the law and has it been placed in both names, uh, it was owned equally by both of them. And the issue was, um, as has been confirmed um, in all of these cases, is what was the party's common intention. Um, slightly different from a, a normal domestic case, but nonetheless the parties uh, agreed to treat it in a domestic context rather than an investment property. Um, undoubtedly the right decision as they were ultimately living in it, um, albeit not every day. So the, the decision in, the, in that case um, was a finding in favour of the defendant um, as to joint beneficial ownership. Uh, and. Uh, Effectively, the case was won on the principle laid out in, in stack that equity um, follows the law and because the, uh, the property had been purchased in joint names, it was to be owned jointly by the parties. Uh, and this was despite the fact that the property had been paid for entirely by the claimant. It was despite the fact that the parties had their own separate homes, uh, were described as having independent busy lives uh, and this was a property that was strictly speaking, not to be their family home. Um, the judgment flagged up um, the case of Marr and Colley, which we uh, looked at briefly. Um, but despite that, the parties, um, say, agreed to approach it on a domestic context and therefore that the principles set out in Stack and Dowden and Jones and Colonel uh, were found to apply. And the judge reiterated, as the judge uh, did in the case in Ammon, that uh, the question and the search uh, for the judge was the intention of the parties, um, not a question of fairness, as we often, well, as we always see in a um, matrimonial context. And the judge actually stated that um, it was a conveyance into joint names in the context of parties who were then in love saw their future together, had previously read, digested and signed joint ownership of property form, returned it to the convincing solicitor saying it's our intention is to purchase this house as joint tenants and that is the best evidence of what was intended. Uh, and it was found therefore that the claimant's evidence as to what he contended their respective intentions to be did not uh, fit with the contemporaneous documents. Uh, and that was fortified um, by the level of advice given at the time of transfer. And as you'll recall, um, the advice given to the parties was one of the key factors set out in paragraph 69 of Stack. Um, there was a, a, an interesting discussion surrounding the levels of each party's respective interest in the party um, on the basis that the claimant contended that he spent um, more time and more money in structural work, whereas the defendant um, contended uh, they were close enough uh, on her expenditure in the running costs and, and the judge ultimately refused um, the claimant's contention and refused to infer or impute uh, an intention as to the level of interest any different to the 50-50 that was established at the time of acquisition. Uh, and there was also a, a discussion of occupational rent which I, I promised I would touch on. Um, a, a finding of occupational rent was made um, on behalf of the claimant, given that he had been effectively refused um, permission to return to the property um, for reasons which are obvious uh, if you read either the judgment or the Daily Mail article. Um, but in terms of occupational rent, the judge stated that it was more of an art than a science, uh, made reference to the statutory criteria uh, and ultimately awarded a, a daily rate to the claimant for weekend usage 
set against the market value or the market rental value of the property. Uh, uh, and I suppose it's, it's worth examining in a little bit more detail any claims for occupational rent. Um, it's arguable it could give it a full talk on this alone, but it's worth um, bearing in mind the following principles. Firstly, to be aware of it because it is often um, omitted in any claim um, for or in any claim on Talata when making a claim on behalf of a party not an occupation. Um, second point is that it parties may need evidence to ascertain the actual market rental value. And the third point to note in any claim for occupational rent is that it is commonly uh, on a broad brush basis set off um, against the interest payments made on the mortgage, assuming that the party who remains in occupation continues to pay the mortgage and the party who's been excluded from the property does not. The fundamental considerations in any claim for occupational rent and the fundamental task of the court is ultimately to do justice to the parties with due regard to the statutory considerations uh, and it's largely made uh, or secured on the basis that there's a finding that one of the parties has been unreasonably excluded or restricted from the parties. Um, that uh, I hope concludes a useful um, summary of uh, some recent uh, Talata decisions as, as well as an overview of the principles set out in Stack, Dowden, Jones and Colonel and Marr and Colley uh, and those um, practitioners either in a domestic context or commercial um, context will have I hope a, a better uh, idea of what um, the important points are in any Talata dispute uh, and will be better placed to advise um, their clients uh, accordingly. Um, the procedure in any Talata case is relatively straightforward. In a nutshell, if there's a significant dispute of fact, it's to be issued as a part seven, if not part eight. And um, I suppose to, to finalise a uh, parting comment as a accredited mediator, it would be remiss of me not to encourage parties to at the very least consider ADR in these cases um, for the reason being it affords a significantly greater flexibility to the parties in reaching an agreement and particularly bearing in mind the parameters and limitations of the court's power under section 14. Um, I trust that does assist but please do not hesitate to contact me directly if there are any questions uh, arising or if you have any queries whether generally or with regard to a particular case and uh, thank you again for watching. Hello my name is Matthew Crow, and my talk concerns the maxim of caveat emptor and its true influence in modern property law. Caveat emptor is an elegant concept. It's an easy focus for judicial thought and an oft cited phrase by defendants in property litigation. But it's being slowly eroded and in the year, as the years have gone by, it's begun to mutate. Only recently, at the very end of 2020, in the midst of a property market boom, the Law Society has issued careful guidance, which said that recent changes to the law have reduced the application of caveat emptor, and they may even impinge upon the traditional notion of the solicitor-client confidentiality relationship. The Law Society's view has been corroborated in recent publications by the Council for Licensed Conveyances, who have suggested we may be moving away from traditional notions of buyer beware and towards a more modern concept of seller beware. Indeed, in the last few months, the Law Commission is now hot on the trail of this issue and is asking the very pertinent question. Is caveat emptor still the appropriate starting point for property purchases? With that in mind, my webinar addresses the question, what are the duties of disclosure in modern property transactions? The general principle and the starting point remains caveat emptor, but it's only a starting point. 
and the principle itself is subject to several caveats, chief among which are three scenarios. First, where there exists certain defects in the title to the property. Second, where there has been some form of deceit. And third, importantly, where consumer protection laws now apply. The third and final scenario there is something worth exploring in detail, but I will briefly touch upon now the first two circumstances. First, defects in title. On the one hand, a vendor is expected to disclose encumbrances and other defects in the title of the property, which a purchaser could not discover for themselves by inspecting a property with reasonable care. Now, there is a blurred line between what is considered reasonably discoverable and therefore patent, and what is not and therefore classed as latent. This has been the subject of frequent and considerable litigation in recent years and remains a fact-sensitive issue. I've included a number of examples in the handout that accompanies this webinar, but generally speaking, latent defects of title may include rights of way, drainage, restrictive covenants, matters of that nature. Patent defects, however, those that may be more obvious, will be covered by the traditional notion of caveat emptor, unless there is some form of misrepresentation through either misleading descriptions or deceit. On the other hand, at common law, a vendor holds no duty to disclose to a purchaser any defects affecting the quality of the land sold. That could mean the construction of the property, the design. These things are generally caught by caveat emptor. As a notable example, which I'll return to later, in the 2004 case of Sykes and Taylor Rose, one vendor didn't reveal that the home had been the scene of a gruesome murder. But this at the time, and according to the court, wasn't required to be disclosed and was covered by the principle of caveat emptor. That's the first broad exception to caveat emptor, defects in title. The second is fraud. For example, fraudulent misrepresentations about the existence of disputes with uh, neighbours, such as in the case of McMeekin and Long. It could include circumstances such as the deliberate, deliberate concealment of extensive dry rot, such as in the case of Gordon and Selico. Or it could involve the surreptitious removal of flagstones before completion, such as in the case of Taylor and Hamer. Deceit is always going to be fact specific, but it will, in every case, defeat the caveat emptor principle. The third exception to caveat emptor, concerns consumer protection laws. As I noted at the start, the Law Society has suggested that the largely untested consumer protection from unfair trading regulations may water down our understanding of caveat emptor. Their view is that the regulations, which were significantly broadened in 2014, may impose a requirement on a vendor to disclose defects that they know about, whether they are patent or latent. Now, there's an obvious tension brewing between the Law Society's opinion of these regulations and the common law position, as I previously outlined. It's therefore worth inspecting the regulations in a little more detail now. Among other matters, the regulations are designed to shield consumers from unfair trading practices. A particular unfair practice the regulations cover is the making of misleading omissions. And this is key. The term misleading omission 
within the regulations which originate from the European Union is far broader in its definition than conventional misrepresentation cases. The phrase includes an omission or hiding of material information or even providing information in a manner, in a manner which is unintelligible, vague or even late and as a result causes or is likely to cause the average consumer to take a different transactional decision. Now this duty specifically applies to the sale of a movable property. This duty could capture within its remit, for example, late or vague answers in a home buyer pack. It may extend so far as to include a duty on the vendor's solicitor individually to disclose an adverse survey of a property or adverse information they know about in the deeds, even where the client instructs not to make a disclosure. Even if the solicitor to the vendor only knows of the existence of a piece of material information and not its contents, it could still amount to a misleading omission not to disclose its existence to the purchaser. Again, even without the client's instructions to do so. This is the view of the Law Society. They can draw support from the National Trading Standards Estate Agency team, which has also issued guidance about the regulations recently. They consider that any information, any information that materially affects the property must be voluntarily disclosed. They say the duty under the regulations includes, for example, the property being under a busy flight path, nearby planning proposals, Japanese knotweed in the garden, and even, and notably, unusual events at the property, such as a recent suicide or murder. That last example is notably inconsistent with the case of Sykes and Taylor Rose, which I mentioned earlier. That case of Sykes and Taylor Rose was decided before these regulations came into force and decided under the traditional common law principles. These regulations are plainly causing professional bodies, such as Trading Standards, the Law Society, to be cautious about the traditional approach to caveat emptor. The concerns are well founded. But the question must be asked, are these regulations all bark and no bite? Possibly. Generally, a consumer who falls victim to unfair practices, such as these misleading omissions, may have a right of redress, damages, discounts, even unwinding the transaction. But these regulations, while they do impose duties in respect of immovable property, they also specifically exclude the right to redress. They prevent a claimant, a purchaser, from securing damages or unwinding a transaction in relation to immovable property, other than specific types of leases, such as leases uh, under which property is let as a holiday home, assured tenancies, matters of that nature. Accordingly, the only method by which a claimant might obtain compensation while using these regulations is expressly disapplied in relation to the purchase of property. We therefore arrive at an unusual situation whereby there exist duties not to make certain types of omissions in relation to all property, but redress under the regulations is expressly prevented. That is not to say that these general expectations on vendors under the regulations are not germane to most cases. They certainly will be in almost all misrepresentation cases. But they will not be the sole vehicle by which claimants can secure compensation. It is worth noting that, while not the subject of this webinar, there are also certain regulatory offences under the regulations, 
but even they have ar arrived with a catalogue of defences. Defences including mistake, reliance on third party information, accident, exercising due diligence. The duties either way under the regulations remain and are clear, even if redress under the Act is excluded. Overall, with the increasing number of exceptions to caveat emptor, the law seems to be driving towards a revisit of this once timeless principle. The drive seems to have been accelerated not just by EU legislation, but also the rise of technology during lockdown. Remote viewings, fewer surveys, increased reliance on quality assurance schemes such as the Buildmark Guarantee. But traditional methods of giving purchasers opportunities to discover the details of defects may no longer suffice in light of these consumer protection laws. More transparent, more cautious and increasingly inquisitorial approaches are needed in conveyancing and may invariably come back to bite conveyances and vendors later down the line. Nowadays, it is the seller who must beware just as much as the buyer. Thank you. Hello, my name's Nicola Allen. I'm a barrister, a property barrister. I'm also a chartered town planner, um, and I still do actually practice sometimes, not very often, as an expert witness alongside my advocacy and paper practice. Um, the subject today is the new legislation um, on re-deregularisation of the planning system, and particularly as it relates to the high street. Just by way of background, um, the Conservative election commitment was to boost the housing supply and simplify the planning system, amongst others. Um, one simplification of the planning system was to remove red tape for businesses and, of course, to stimulate growth. Um, just some statistics to sit on top of that um, political background. In the past three years, um, so that was January 2018 to 21, so pre but actually running into the COVID um, period, 27 million square feet of retail, um, financial and business floor space was exited. Um, of course, at the moment, um, in the recent past, leases have tended to be shorter with more break clauses. And another statistic is that at Christmas 2020, so this is absolutely in the middle of COVID, 14% um, of retail units were empty. Another commitment that the um, Conservatives made was in September 2019, where they committed money to the New Towns Fund just before the election, which is no surprise. And this is part of the much wider levelling up agenda, and it's predominantly funding across the Northern Powerhouse and the Midland, Midlands engine areas. So in July 2021, quite recently, the government announced a new strategy which is called Build Back Better. So of course it's a snappy three-word strategy. The legislation I'm going to talk about today are, is the Use Classes Order, the General Permitted Development Order 2015, the Town and Country Planning Use Classes Amendment England Regulations 2020, and the changes, the amendments to the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Order, which became effective on the 1st of September this year. So the basic issues um, that run through all of those new pieces of legislation are the introduction of a very wide ranging new use class. Um, also sitting alongside that, um, there's a broad range of permitted development rights. And basically now, particularly in relation to high streets, um, there are many changes of use which do not require formal planning permission. So I suppose you're asking, why does that all matter? Um, simply this, because the new Class E, and I'll come on to explain the different land uses that fall within it, has been deregulated. So in effect, a property that is in one of the individual uses in Class E can change to any of the others without the requirement for planning permission. It is a very significant deregulation, um, and in particular to town centre uses. So just sort of by way of introduction, the use classes order originates um, 
from 1987. I'd actually just started work after university in 1987, but I can tell you now it was a whole different world. Um, I did look up today and in the top 10 were a very strange combination of the Pet Shop Boys, Whitney Houston and Rick Astley. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, just bear this in mind, the World Wide Web had not yet been invented. So you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. So imagine that era, if you can. And at that point in time, there were only four use classes covering all the land uses that property can be in. There are also specific exceptions. There always are. We used to call them the, the nasties. And in 1987, believe it or not, that included cat's meat shops and tripe shops. So the modern world, what about today? Today, um, we've got the Consolidated Act, which stems from 2015. And the class that I'm going to talk about, as I've said, is Class E. It's a composite of many commercial business and service uses. So it amalgamates three of the previous uses. So basically, um, all of the uses in Class E, I'll just rattle through them because there are quite a few, are sort of uses that you would see on a high street or um, in a town centre. So retail shops, restaurants, uh, cafes, financial and professional services, indoor sport and recreation, so that includes gyms, but it specifically excludes guns and vehicles. Uh, medical and health services, creche, day nursery, day centres, offices, of course you see those in the town centre, research and development, that's probably less usual, also light industrial uses, but those are only industrial uses which um, can take place in a residential area, and therefore they mustn't cause sort of noise or dust or pollution. So specific uses which are excluded, so they are always going to be controlled moving forward, are public houses, drinking establishments, hot food takeaways, cinemas, concert halls, and I think a real throwback to 1987, bingo halls. Um, there are now the modern nasties, which will always need planning permission, and it's a very strange list now, it's very modern. It includes nail bars, um, payday loan shops, massage parlours, believe it or not. Um, so those are the uses that can and cannot take place in town centres. There are some other permitted development rights, um, which the Conservative government, as one would perhaps expect of a free market government, have brought in. Um, as I've said, all the Class E uses are now completely interchangeable without the need for planning permission. So in theory, uh, you can buy a bank and you can turn it into a cafe. Uh, you could lease an office and turn it into a shop immediately. There are other permitted development rights which the Conservatives have also brought in. Class E, so all of those business and commercial uses that I rattled off earlier on, um, you can change any of those now to residential or to mixed use and residential or to a school without the need for plan permission. However, there are certain prior notification procedures that you would have to go through. Um, also permitted development, um, the nasty uses, so the nail bars, the pubs, um, payday loan shops, those, any of those buildings can automatically change to a use that is permissible under Class E without the need for planning permission. So that's sort of the background to the legislation. And together, you're probably asking, well, that, how is this going to affect how you may give legal advice to your clients? I think the first point is that early in the process, um, you must establish the planning status and potential of any property. And you may have to take uh, appropriate legal advice on that. But in terms of legal advice, what you then have to consider is one of your clients may be over the moon and think they've got the perfect property and the perfect use for it. But what you need to check, and these are the sort of pitfalls, are limitations which may cut across permitted development. So you may have uh, restrictive conditions on a planning permission. You may have a Section 106 legal agreement that restricts use of land. Um, you may have a lease which has restrictive covenants in it. And also, this, um, these new changes bear upon how dilapidations will be dealt with and they will impact on repurposing of buildings and also valuations. <laughs>
So if we just sort of look at this maybe on a more practical level, a client comes along to you, um, they're starting a business hopefully, they're maybe relocating a business. It could be anywhere, it could be Newcastle, Hexham, Morpeth. So the relevant checks would be undertaken, so the title will be checked, um, the local land charges searches will be done, and the planning history should come up on the um, local land charges search. So in terms of planning, it's really important to know what the lawful use of the property is already. So it may be an established use, for example, that's the first category. So that would be, it's a shop, it's always been a shop, um, and that's its lawful use. Uh, the second way is um, planning permission could have been granted. So this would probably more relate to new property, new shops, or perhaps the more modern retail parks that we see. There may have been a change of use in the past, and that may have been under a planning permission or it may have been a permitted development change. Another thing to watch out for is a property could may well be in a use um, and it has been in a use for 10 years and that will then become the lawful use. It will be immune from enforcement action but that may need regularising. Um, there's a mechanism to do that. If you want to make sure that you know what the lawful use of a property is, you can apply for a certificate of lawful use. Um, from the local authority and that will confirm what the lawful use is now so that could be the existing use or you can actually apply for a certificate to say this is a new use that the client wants to put uh, a building to in the future and you can get a certificate saying that's fine um, you don't need plan permission to do that okay so if you've established what um, the lawful use of a building is, the second thing that you have to consider is, is the use restricted or limited in any way? So you need to check for planning conditions, which may limit a sub-use class. Um, if there is a restriction on a planning permission, that will override all of the permitted development rights because any new use would be in breach of it. Um, so it's important that that's established. Um, also want to look for older industrial estates. There are often conditions limiting um, certain types of industrial use, so you need to be aware of any of those sorts of limitations. Um, another policy issue, often retail uses are subject to policy tests to protect town centres. Um, and so retail uses are deliberately focused to town centres. And a planning application, say, for an out of edge of centre or an out of centre property will probably be resisted. Of course, moving forward, I'll talk about this in a minute, um, that's one of the key um, issues of deregulation. Another thing to check is, have permitted development rights been removed by an Article 4 direction? This is a mechanism where the local authority um, issues an Article 4 direction on a particular area of land and removes whatever class of permitted development rights they choose to do. In the recent past, quite a lot of local authorities have chosen to do this in order to either protect their town centre retail areas and also to protect um, office blocks from being converted into housing under permitted development. And that was a very common concern pre-COVID. Obviously now, everybody's working from home. Um, many local authorities may reassess their position and that won't be as much of an issue. Another control may be a Section 106 legal agreement. Uh, these are binding on the land. They're very similar to restrictive covenants, so they run with the land. They are disclosed on the land register, so they're not too much of a problem to find, and in theory you can amend them. But provided they still fulfil any planning purpose, not just the original one, councils generally um, are reluctant to amend them. So if we look at restrictive covenants, this is an important um, another issue that um, interacts with planning, the new planning legislation. Um, because what might happen, your client may come to you, they may want to purchase or lease a new building. They're very excited about it. Boris has told them how flexible he's going to be. Um, he's going to rejuvenate the high street. Uh, in all likelihood at the moment, it may well be an office block that's been empty for a while. And your client may want to turn, turn it to, I don't know, a light industrial use or professional services, for example. However, any restrictive covenant, as you're probably all aware, will override the permitted development rights. So what you may need to look at is, if your client's very keen, how to um, remove the restrictive covenant. Can the validity of that be challenged? Um, can it be varied or removed? That would mean an application to the upper tribunal. Or is it an unreasonable restraint of trade? and can you challenge it in that way?
So there's a couple of cases on restrictive covenants which I think are quite useful to show just in practice how the planning system interacts with the other legal mechanisms. The first case is um, Shavaram Normandy Limited and Basingstoke and Deal Borough Council, and that's a 2019 case. Um, the building was owned by the council. It was held on a long head lease, and um, Shavaram Normandy were took the building, and obviously they were responsible for rent, and there was also 15.5% um, apportionment of the annual rent under the sublease. But whilst the building could be converted from offices into houses with no plan permission whatsoever, there was a covenant on the lease saying that it should only be used for offices. So interestingly, in this case, the council owned the site. So the council confirmed it was permitted development, absolutely no problem with the plan permission whatsoever. But as landlord, the council refused to lift the covenant. Um, Shaviram were very savvy. And what they did is they made an application under Section 84 of the Law of Property Act to the lands, um, to the upper tribunal. And um, after hearing a lot of evidence, the tribunal considered the values office and residential, um, they were quite similar. So on that basis, there was no practical benefit to the covenant. Um, they also considered the thin end of the wedge argument. Basically, the local authority's planning authority argued that they had a duty to protect the economic well-being of the town, and therefore they wanted this building to remain in office use. They also didn't want it to become housing because they argued that would undermine their housing allocations on other sites elsewhere. However, the tribunal didn't accept those points, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, basically, the tribunal held that there was already an oversupply of offices uh, in that particular area, so the retention of this particular building as an office didn't confer a benefit. And also, they characterised it as a commercial uh, dispute and they didn't attach any weight to the local authority as local planning authority. Um, there's a second case which is quite interesting. This is Barclay Square Investments Limited and Barclay Square Holdings. Um, it's not a permitted development case but it's a restrictive covenant in a lease case so it's quite illuminating. Basically there was a very attractive grade one listed building as you would imagine in Barclay Square. Um, planning permission was granted by the council to change the building from offices to a private members club. The freeholder owned properties either side and the adjacent property was already a private members club. So you can sort of see where this one's going. Anyway, there was a single user covenant contained on the long lease saying that the building can only be used for offices. The applicant argued that there was no demand for offices in the area However, the tribunal found there was a limited demand for office space in the area. And the fact that the freeholder, um, sorry, the leaseholder had made no attempt to let the sublease or market the property, the tribunal said it would be wholly wrong to find that the covenant was obsolete. What the freeholder argued, obviously they were trying to protect their other properties, is that they didn't want three members, private members clubs together because it would create competition. What the tribunal found, interestingly, is that none of the objections had sufficient merit to demonstrate that the practical benefit to the freeholder, there was one of substantial advantage. And they also found that impeding the proposed um, private members' use was not in the public interest. And one of the factors they took into account, and this is really the key to the case from my point of view, is that planning permission was in place, all the relevant licenses were in place, and therefore the private members club was demonstrated to be a reasonable user. And this is how I think that the new um, deregularised Class E and also the permitted development rights are going to engage with Section 84 of the Property Act. Because basically, if a building has planning permission or does not need planning permission for a particular use, then that is always deemed to be, in effect, a reasonable user of that building. So you can have very, very different uses. So for example, you could have a massage parlour change into a creche, but under section, 70, um, section 84, 
um, that would be seen as a reasonable user of the building. Just thirdly, um, the new legislation impacts on dilapidations. Um, previously, we've, we've had a podcast where Paul Rayburn, a surveyor, gave a very interesting talk, and it's certainly worth looking at that if you um, deal with dilapidations and leases. We're all very aware of a substantially changing retail and business world. Um, this particularly relates to bricks and mortar property. Uh, and you recall, as I said at the beginning, 27 million square feet has exited from commercial uses in the past three years. And there's another um, statistic, 66% of leases signed in 2015 will break or expire by 2025. So that very much points to an oversupply of certain types of building and a need for reconfiguring. Of course, the majority of properties when they come to the end of a lease do need um, some modernising but in this day and age, because the market is very dynamic, they often lead an awful lot more than that, and they can be completely repurposed. Um, there's an example just along here in Newcastle, a modern office block. I remember it being built, and I'm not that old. It was built for BT as their main headquarters building. Um, BT didn't need it anymore, probably about three or four years ago. And that very large building has been completely repurposed for two new hotels. So even within a very short period of time, less than 20 years, that's happened. So how does this flexibility impact on values and settlements in terms of dilapidations? Of course, the tenant can argue that the property that they're leaving is likely to be significantly upgraded, and so any works will be superseded and won't be taken into account as dilapidations. So I think when surveyors are looking at dilapidations, when lawyers are looking at them, um, there has to be an understanding of the present and future market for that particular building. And that is how the planning system and the new Class E and the very wide-ranging permitted development rights will um, heavily, the planning system will heavily inform other areas of law. So just as a really by way of closing, these are very personal thoughts. What will this flexibility bring about in reality? Well, it will certainly open up the market. There's no doubt about that. A lot of new uses will um, be free to move about. There'll be new leases, which I think will have to be more flexible to take account of the um, permitted development and Class E. Um, Section 84 um, and restrictive covenants, I think, will be used more by savvy developers saying, look, the planning system says this is fine. Why is my lease holding me back? Um, personally, I think huge opportunities are around the corner to restructure the high street and town centres. And I think that's, that's generally um, the thrust of, of my thoughts on this issue. Mm -hmm.